ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله والصفي وخليله ارسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا اما بعد so alhamdulillah um this afternoon during the khutbah uh we talked about a topic um that i think concerns us all and that is the topic of uh you know maintaining our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so i just want to kind of go back through some of uh the things that we talked about during the khutbah just as a reminder inshallah ta'ala for us all uh i begin by saying that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god created mankind for one purpose and one purpose only and that is to serve him that is to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone as allah says in the quran wa ma khalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liya'budun i did not create the man i did not create mankind and the jinn except to worship me uh however in in our journey to being you know uh servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh sometimes we can compromise this journey by external and internal obstacles uh and one of the hadith that I mentioned I mentioned some of the external op- obstacles that you know impede our journey to being better servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that was the hadith with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said badiru bil a'mal sab'an hasten to do good deeds before you are confronted with seven things and these seven things all right these seven things represent external obstacles external obstacles to our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said badiru bil a'mal hasten to do good deeds meaning condition yourself to do good deeds while you are in times of ease and comfort right and convenience so that if you in fact are afflicted with one of these seven things then you will continue with that process of ubudiya of servitude because you have already conditioned yourself so now it becomes habitual This is the same way people always ask well if the shayateen are chained up in Ramadan then how do people still commit sin because it's a conditioning process shaytan conditions us throughout the year to sin so by the time that Ramadan comes in sin has already become habitual for many of us So even when Ramadan comes in we're still sinning even in Ramadan we think that sin is supposed to magically stop just because Ramadan is in the shayateen are chained up the doors of paradise are open the gates of the hellfire are closed right and we think that automatically the sins that we were committing all year long are supposed to somehow just de- the you know cease and desist it doesn't work like that it, human beings are creatures of habit and we develop habits whether positive or negative whether healthy or unhealthy All right so we de- you know we develop habits with certain behaviors and and certain characteristics and that doesn't just go away because once you condition yourself it becomes a part of who you are right where there's a actually there's a there's a, a famous quote that says be careful of your thoughts because your thoughts become actions your actions become you know your personality all right your it becomes your part of who you are you've done it so much you know it it now becomes a part of who you are and sin works the same way and uh actions of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they function the same way that if you condition yourself to do good deeds all the time when things are easy for you when when you're in a time place of convenience and ease then when times get difficult it'll already be second nature it'll already be a part of you So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said badiru bil a'mal sab'an hasten to do good deeds now while you're in the state when you're in a good state when you're in a state of ease right and convenience 
before you are afflicted with seven things. And then he begins to mention those seven things, and those seven things represent external obstacles to our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Hal illa faqaran munsiya. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for faqar, for poverty to overtake you that will cause you to forget the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over you and the right of others? Right? As I said earlier, that in our pursuit of our own happiness, we tend to infringe on and trample over the happiness of other people. And you don't have a right to do that. Everyone has a right to be happy. It's a God-given right that I don't need permission from anybody to have. I don't need anybody's permission to be happy. That is a God-given right for every single one of us. Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and Hawa, He told them to live in Jannah. وَكُلُوا مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ And he told Bani Israel, you know, dwell in, in Egypt and eat of the good that we have provided you. To enjoy, to, to, you know, pursue your happiness. He told Adam and Hawa, you know, eat of, of all the things that are lawful in Jannah. وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ But don't come close to this particular tree. But eat and enjoy everything. There's a God-given happiness that is attached to just by default of you being created as a human being and put here. But you don't have a right in your pursuit of your happiness to infringe on the happiness of other people. And that's a concept that we still have not grasped yet as human beings, as Muslims. We think that our end justifies our means. So if my end goal is to be happy, everything that I have to do in order to... We think that because the, our, our end is happiness, then it justifies the means. al ghayatu la tubarri'u al-wasila. In Islam, the ghaya, the end does not justify the means. But we think it does. Because we are in pursuit of our happiness and we think that anything that we have to do to get there, no matter who we got to step on, no matter whose happiness we have to infringe on, we're justified because I'm going after my happiness. I need to be happy. Yeah, but you need to be happy, but not infringe on somebody else's happiness. Because it's then, in that case, it's not actually true happiness. Because if you attain happiness by infringing on the happiness of someone else, then it's not true happiness. Because you didn't attain it in a way where there were no strings attached. Pure happiness, true happiness, is when there's no strings attached. I don't owe anybody, and nobody owes me anything. I'm good. I've arrived at my destination of happiness without having infringed on anyone else, right? Because it makes no sense to arrive at your goal and then have to watch over your back. Have to worry about somebody making dua against you. Have to worry about somebody, you having slighted somebody in your pursuit of your happiness. Then it's not true happiness, all right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, هَلْ تَنْتَذِرُونَ إِلَّا فَقْرًا مُنْسِئًا are you waiting for poverty to overtake you that will cause you to forget? Ali ibn Abi Talib, he clarified this by saying, Kada al fakr an yakuna kufran, fa inna al fakr munsiyan haq Allahi jalla wa ala wa haq al ghair. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said that poverty was almost going to be or, or is akin to kufr, akin to disbelief. Poverty is akin to disbelief. Why? Because poverty causes you to forget about the right of a law over you and the right of other people over you. People have rights over you. you. You don't get to just pursue your happiness, right? And just forget about everybody else because you on your journey to happiness. La wallahi. Your journey to happiness, you are entitled to that. But you are not entitled to infringe on somebody else's. And you are not entitled because you are pursuing your happiness to forget about the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over you. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ And do not be like those who forgot about Allah. Don't be like those who forgot about Allah. And you have a ton of, you have many Muslims today who are in pursuit of their happiness, whether that pursuit is financial gain or stability, whether that is, you know, social acceptance, 
It doesn't matter what it is. Whatever your pursuit is or whatever you think is going to make you happy in your pursuit of that, sometimes we've forgotten about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've forgotten that Allah even has a right over us. As uh, Abdullah, as uh, Mu'adh bin Jabal, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked him, Hal tadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad wa haqq al-ibadi ala Allah? Do you know what the right of Allah is over his servants and the right of the servants over Allah? He said, Wallahu wa rasuluhu a'lam, Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, Haqqullahi ala ibad, and ta'buduhu wa la tushriku bihi shay'a. The right of Allah over his servants is that you serve him and that you associate no partner with him. That is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over his servants. Is that you serve him and you not associate partners with him. And in our pursuit of our happiness, we forget about the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't have to worship Allah. I don't have to serve Allah. I'm doing me. That's what we say, right? I'm doing me. I'm going, meaning, I'm doing me, meaning I'm going after what makes me happy. But in your pursuit of what makes you happy, you are forgetting about what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what makes Allah happy. And when you put your desires over the desire, or, or you put your desire over the right of Allah, or over what Allah wants from you, then you have essentially taken your desires as your God besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you're not, that's what, this when pursuit of your happiness becomes your God. Following your desire becomes your God. Allah says in the Quran, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَاهُ have you not seen the one who's taken his own desires as his God besides Allah? Because now your desire dictates what makes you, what, what is happy, what is good, what is lawful. And this is aside from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already said, what is good and what is lawful. You have taken, essentially taken your desire. I hope you guys are paying attention, man. I hope you guys are paying attention. This is how a person in pursuit of his own desires has made his, his God his own desires. So the Prophet ﷺ said, هَلْ تَنْتَذِرُونَ إِلَّا فَقْرًا مُنْسِيًا Are you waiting for poverty to overtake you so that it causes you to forget about the right of Allah and the right of others over you? Poverty, brothers and sisters, is one of the biggest impediments for nurturing our iman, nurturing our faith, and nurturing our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because essentially we are pursuing what we don't have instead of nurturing what we do have. We are pursuing what we don't have and at the expense of not nurturing what we do have. You do have Allah. And when you have God, you have everything. You just have to nurture that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of our relationships with Allah are still in the infant stage. Right? Our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still in its infant stage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Bedouin Arabs who used to brag that they believe and you know, no matter where they accepted Islam or at what period in time in the Prophet's mission they accepted Islam, they were still had the same level of faith as those who were with the Prophet from the beginning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We call it al-A'rabu amanna. The Bedouin Arabs, they used to brag and say, see, we believe just like everybody else that follows Muhammad, we believe just like them. Allah says, Kulla tu'minu, say you don't believe. Walakin aslamna, but say you have only submitted. Walamma yadkhul al-imanu fi qulubikum. True faith has yet to enter your hearts. You haven't nurtured that. You have some, yani qadr mushtarak. You have some degree, some level of faith. Everybody does have some level of faith. Whether you follow Islam or you follow any religion or you don't. Everybody has some degree of faith and belief in God. Some degree. Some choose to ignore it. Some choose to neglect it. And that is what makes a person a kafir, a disbeliever. Someone who chooses or fails to acknowledge that innate belief in God. They fail to acknowledge it. They cover it because that's what a kafir is, is a farmer, someone who tills the land, who takes old dirt and flips the new dirt on top of it. That's what you do with the uh, predisposition to believe in God. You take that and you flip that with a new belief or beliefs that you force feed yourself to accept. 
That is what a kafir is, or a disbeliever. All right? But everybody has some level of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kullam tu'minu. Don't say you believe. Walakin kulu aslamna. But say you have only submitted. You've only embraced Islam. You've only uh, accepted Islam. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ That true faith has yet to enter into your heart. True belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has yet to enter into your heart. You haven't nurtured your faith, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still in its infant stages. You gotta nurture that. You gotta nurture that. And unfortunately, some people in their pursuit of what they believe makes them happy, they don't nurture they don't nurture that faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a, a long period of time, a span of time, you know, goes by and they haven't nurtured their faith and then eventually they start to have second doubt. They start having second beliefs, uh, second questioning whether or not, second questioning whether or not Islam is even for them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابُ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَطَّالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَقَسَّتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Allah said, and don't be like those who were given the book before, the Jews and the Christians. And a long period of time, you know, transpired. A long period of time passed by, and they did not nurture their faith. And their hearts became hardened. And you have some Muslims who in pursuit of their happiness, they don't nurture their faith, their hearts become hard, and although they finally reach their destination, or they, they really don't because, you know, satisfying that material side of us is insatiable. You can't satisfy. Given two valleys filled with gold, right? If he was given two valleys, wadiani min dhahab, he was given two valleys filled with gold, let tamanna tharitha, he would desire a third. Well, if he was given a valley filled with gold, he would desire another one. Because that, that material side is insatiable. So while we are pursuing what we believe is going to make us happy, we have to realize that there has to be a threshold to that. There has to be a cutoff point, right? There has to be a cutoff point because in your pursuit of dunya, of worldly happiness, right? Gratification, you have to realize that that is insatiable. You're never going to be able to feel that. So it's like you're on this wheel, right? You're, you're on the, the, the rat, the, 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 the hamster wheel. And around and around and around you go, but you're never going to change. You're never going. It is, a, it is a farce to believe that at some point you are going to reach your goal of happiness if your end goal is materialism. You're never going to be satisfied. You're going to desire more. The more you get, the more you desire he said that if the child of Adam was given two valleys filled with gold, he would desire a third. Nothing will suffice the child of Adam until he is covered in dirt. Until dirt is put in his mouth, meaning until he's buried. That desire is insatiable. So, you know, in pursuing, you know, what we believe is, uh, is, is going to make us happy, we have to understand we don't want to forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this quote for, right? Listen to this quote from Ibn Qayyim. Ibn Qayyim, he said, مَا أَغْلَقَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عَبْدٍ بَابًا بِحِكْمَتِهِ إِلَّا فَتَحَ لَهُ بَابَيْنِ بِرَحْمَتِهِ Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never closes a door on a servant of his, right? By his wisdom. Allah does not close a door on his servant by his wisdom, illa fataha lahu babaini bi rahmatihi, except that Allah opens two other doors for you by his mercy. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Profound, brothers and sisters. Profound. Let me repeat that. He said. ما أغلق الله على عبد بابا بحكمته إلا فتح له بابين برحمته. That Allah does not close a door on His servant. You find that a door closed 
you didn't gain access to this or you didn't gain access to that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never closes a door on his servant by his wisdom. Allah is not oppressing you. Allah is not oppressing God is not doing you wrong or doing you dirty or somehow oppressing you or somehow not letting you have access to something out of some jealousy or out of some, you know, hatred for you. As Bani Israel, as the Jews said, um, uh, that they said, Qalu yadullahi maghlula, that God's hands are tied. Right, God's hands, he clo he's tight-fisted. He doesn't want to give us from this world. Allah says, Allah says, That Allah says, May their hands be, you know, tied. And lu'inu bima qalu, and may they be cursed for what they say. Bel yadahu mabsutatani, rather Allah's hands are stretched forth, and he spins on his servant, he gives to his servants how he wills. Allah doesn't give you according to your desires, because if Allah gave us according to our desires, we would have been destroyed a long time ago. We don't even know how to differentiate between what is good for us and what is bad for us. Our moral compass has been compromised by the capitalism that we live in. The capitalism, right, that defines our personalities as Americans has compromised our ability to distinguish what is good for us and what is bad for us. Most of us, by nature, by default of living in this country, we are opportunistic. Anytime an opportunity, Wallah al they have TV shows, right? TV shows where they trick people, right? They want to see how much integrity people have. So a guy, he drops a $100 bill on the ground, and then he, you know, has a hidden camera somewhere, and then the guy, a person walking by sees the $100, picks it up. The guy runs behind him and says, hey, you know what? You found the $100. He's like, yeah, that's mine. He said, no, it's not yours. It's mine. I put it there purposely. The guy is literally tussling with him. No, it's my money. The guy's like, yo, I got you on camera. I put the, I put the $100 there. It's my money. And he's still fighting with the guy trying to plead his case that the $100 is his. Just opportunistic, man. We have no, with zero integrity, right? Moral compasses has been compromised a long time ago. So we don't even know what is good for us and what is bad for us. We don't even, we can't even distinguish what is good for us and what is bad for us. Allah says in the Quran, وَيَدْعُوا الْإِنسَانُ بِشَرِّ دُعَاءَ لَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ And the human being supplicates for good, supplicates for evil, asks God for things that are bad, just as often as he asks for things that are good. The human being supplicates, asks God, pleads with God for things that are evil just as often as he pleads for things that are good. Does that sound like a human? Does that sound like an individual who can distinguish what is good from what is bad? Absolutely not. So Ibn al Qayyim, he says, Ma aglaq Allahu ala abdin babin bi hikmatihi illa fatah lahu babaini bi rahmatihi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never closes a door on a servant by way of his wisdom, except that he opens two more doors for him by his mercy. Ibn Qayyim, he continues, he says that if Allah prevents something, prevents you from something that you desire or something that you love, if Allah prevents you from something that you desire and something that you love, either mana Allahu anka shay'an turiduhu wa tuhibbuhu, that if Allah prevents you from something that you love and something that you desire, Bi hikmatihi by his wisdom, wa rahmatihi and by his mercy, fataha laka bi hikmatihi wa rahmatihi abwabin ukhra. Then he opens for you by way of his wisdom and his mercy another door or other doors, 
anfa' laka that is more beneficial for you more beneficial for you fala tahzan wa la ta'as so do not grieve nor fall into despair over your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa kun muqinan and have certainty about the wisdom of Allah the justice of Allah and the mercy of Allah have uh, certainty about the wisdom of Allah, the mercy of Allah, and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is helping us to nurture our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the type, these are the type of words that help us nurture our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get off of that. Muhammad, get off of that. These are the type of things that help us nurture our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, هَلْ تَنْتَذِرُونَ إِلَّا فَقْرًا مُنْسِيَ What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for poverty to overtake you that will cause you to forget about the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, أَوْ غِنًا مُتْغِيًا Or are you waiting for some wealth to fall in your lap that will cause you to be arrogant and cause you to uh, to be transgressing towards other people, right? To be oppressive. Some people worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala good in poverty. But then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places some wealth in their laps, they become arrogant, they become haughty, they become you know oppressive to other people with their wealth. Oppressive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the hypocrites, they said, does Allah want us to give charity to people that if he wanted them to have money, he would have gave it to them himself. Right? This was the, the mind state of the hypocrite. This is the mind state of some people who have money. You have Muslims who have money who come to the masjid and drop nothing. They give nothing to the masjid because they believe in their mind, I'm not spending my money on no masjid. I got other good things that I could be doing with my money. MashaAllah. Meanwhile, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever builds a house for Allah in this dunya, then Allah will build for him a house in Jannah. <laughs> Meanwhile, right? But you're not spending your money on no broken down masjid. You're not giving the masjid no money. But you come to the masjid for Jumu'ah to listen to the khutbah. And maybe you only come by default because you have to. Because I personally believe that a lot of Muslims, if Jumu'ah was not an obligation, they wouldn't even come to Jumu'ah. I personally believe that m many Muslims only come to Jumu'ah by default of it being an obligation. Because if it wasn't an obligation, they wouldn't come to Jumu'ah anyway. Look at what happens when Jumu'ah and Eid fall on the same day. And the moment Muslims realize all they got to do is come to the Eid, they don't have to come to Jumu'ah. Jumu'ah is empty. That's, that's proof. Living proof. Because at that moment, Jumu'ah is not an obligation. So... Here again, if it's not an obligation, I'm not going to do it. Because we don't need food for our spirit. We just need food for our stomach. We don't need food for our soul. We just need food for our stomach. Miss me with all that, you know, 30 minute khutbahs, 15 minutes. You have some messages that the khutbah is like literally 15 minutes. 15 minutes. They are then, it's five minutes long. Literally. They are then, it's five to six minutes long. The opening khutbah is another five minutes the first half of the khutbah is seven minutes. The second half of the khutbah is about seven minutes, eight minutes. That's a total of 30 minutes. Done and, uh, done and over. What type of spiritual nurturing can you get in 30 minutes? Actually, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. What? Because it's just routine. It's just an obligation, fulfilling an obligation, and I'm back to work. You back to work, all in your boss face, all in the women's face, all in the men's face, laughing, giggling, hee hee, ha ha, because that's more important to you. Going to the masjid is just an obligation. I'm just fulfilling an obligation. MashaAllah. He said, هَلْ تَنْتَذِرُونَ إِلَّا فَقْرًا مُنْسِيًا أَوْ غِنًا مُتْغِيًا Are you waiting for poverty to overtake you that will cause you to forget the right of Allah? Are you waiting... For some wealth to fall into your lap that will make you oppressive. Al Maradan Mufsidan. Or are you waiting for are you waiting for a sickness that will disable you? 
Are you waiting for a sickness that will disable you? Some of us, as I said earlier, we spend our young adulthood in sin and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we believe, I'm going to repent later. Right? This is a concept that was in the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. His brothers says, uh, his brothers they said, Uktulu uh, Yusufu, awitrahuhu ardai. That kill Yusuf or throw him uh, into a well. And then we can be righteous afterwards. Well, let's do this to Yusuf now, and then we'll repent later. And you have many Muslims, right? Many Muslims. Yes, a form of punching in and out. Very good. Very good, Al. Very good concept. We punch in and out of Islam. <laughs> punching in and out. Let me punch into the masjid. I made my jumu'ah, I'm good. Right? You got nothing from the Jumu'ah. You got nothing from the Khutbah. Your Iman wasn't motivated. You were not inspired because your heart is completely dead. Right? But then you walk away. Yeah, I was at Jumu'ah today. You ask them, well, what did you get from Jumu'ah? Ah, you know, I can't even remember. Half of the Muslims who leave Jumu'ah can't even remember what they heard at the Khutbah. Because you weren't inspired. You weren't inspired. You got to be able to find inspiration in other places. You can't just go there and say, well, the khutbah was boring. The imam was boring. Everything that comes out of somebody, like every single word that comes out of the person's mouth, you have to be able to find some guidance in that. You can't expect, I'm going to go there and try to be inspired. You have to be a person who is constantly looking for inspiration, no matter where it is. The scholars of the past, I believe it was mentioned about Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, when one of the scholars in the past, they wanted to leave the path of being a scholar. They were on the path of seeking knowledge and thought that it was more difficult for them. Right? Let me show you how scholars of the past, they sought inspiration. We sit back now from a place of privilege and say, hey, imam, hey, student of knowledge, inspire me. Inspire me. Right? If your heart is dead, Genius, it doesn't matter how many lectures you hear, how many khutbas you hear, you're never going to be inspired. Your heart is dead. The number one function of your heart, the number one function of your heart is to be inspired. But that can only happen when your heart is healthy. When your heart is unhealthy, you're, it doesn't, you can hear a million lectures, nothing is going to penetrate. Because your heart is heartened. Your heart is heartened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Bani Israel, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ أَوْ أَشَّدُّ قَسْوَ He said, and then afterwards their hearts became heartened. وَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ Like a rock. Rather even harder than a rock. Some people's hearts right now are harder than a rock. Nothing goes in, nothing comes out. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Qalb al-Aswad kalkuz mujakhiyan. The black heart is like an overturned cup. Nothing goes in, nothing comes out. An overturned cup. That's a black heart. And some of us are like that. You understand? Nothing goes in, and we can't get rid of some of the toxic beliefs that we have. We can't get rid of them, and we cannot create room for new beliefs to replace that. As Ibn Qayyim, he said, وَضْعُ الشَّيْءِ فِي مَوْضِئِهِ مَشْرُوطٌ بِتَفْرِيدِهِ مِنْ ضِدِّهِ Right? وَضْعُ الشَّيْءِ فِي مَحَالِ Putting something in a place, Putting something in a place, mashrutun is conditional by it being void of its opposite. If oil is in a cup, you cannot pour water in there. You have to remove the oil in order to put the cup in because oil is the opposite of water. The two will not mix in the same place. So if you want beneficial knowledge, beneficial information to penetrate your heart, you have to remove the toxic information that is already in there. But when your heart is hard, a black heart, as the Prophet said, Kelkuz Mujahian, it's like an overturned cup. Nothing goes in, 
nothing comes out. Understand how that works? Understand how that works. So our hearts become hard. We don't receive anything. Everything is a joke. You have people who now go, on, go online and make mockery of Islam. Muslims who, you know, create memes and make jokes and mockery about Islam and about Muslims. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. It's a joke. And then we wonder why new converts come into Islam and don't take Islam serious. We are a laughing stock. We are a joke. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ Allah, Except those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon. So are you waiting for marad and mufsidan? Are you waiting for a sickness to overtake you that will disable you? You have some people who spent their entire youth playing around, joking around. Five years went by, you didn't, you didn't pray, you didn't fast, you didn't do nothing. How do you let 10 years of your life go by? No praying, no salat, no fasting, no nothing. And then you come back to Islam. You was like on hiatus, right? You took a break from Islam, and then you come back. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And then, when you come back, you are afflicted with some type of sickness that will impede your ability to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a horrible situation to be in, man. Horrible situation. You come back to Islam, and then you're afflicted with some type of sickness that impedes your ability to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about how many Muslims who are sitting in chairs right now can't go down. I, can't, I couldn't imagine not being able to put my head down on the ground to make sujood. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never test me with that. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never test me or anybody else with not being able to prostrate. That, that has to be, you know, I remember, I remember as a new Muslim, Staring out of my prison cell window Out into the yard Alright, and when you're behind the wall You only get to go out into the yard And there's not a lot of grass in the big yard But you're staring out in the front of the building Where the lawn is mowed, is green And the only thing that I ever wanted to do Was prostrate on the ground Put my head on the ground On the grass and make sujood for years, I stared out of my prison cell window. The only thing I wanted to do was to make sujood in the grass. That's all I wanted to do. I, I, I was waiting for an opportunity to put my head on the grass and prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his green earth. That's all I wanted to do. And here you have Muslims who have their freedom, who have you know everything at their back. And will not go and pray. Will not establish the salah. And are you waiting for a sickness to overtake you that will disable you? You can't prostrate anymore. Think about a Muslim who has to pray sitting in a chair. Can't go down to sujood. And you think about all of the years, that gap in your life where you didn't pray, you didn't fast. And if, if I'm speaking to you and you feel sad right now because of what I'm saying, you ought to. You ought to. And what you better do is pray to God, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he overlooks that gap in your life wherein that you didn't pray and you didn't fast. Pray. I'm tired of dancing around people's feelings. Well, I, I don't necessarily do that anyway, but this whole political correctness. Oh, brother, you need to be this. You need to feel the pain of the consequences of your actions and your behavior. Stop wanting somebody, everybody to placate your feelings, man. So sensitive today. You can't say nothing. You can't say anything to anybody except that they're offended. They walk away offended. So we should just do away with admonishment altogether. The Prophet used to get on the minbar, just impromptu khutbas, lectures, and sermons, admonishing the whole community. Something would happen in the community and he would get on the minbar and admonish the whole entire community. What's wrong with the people that they're doing this or doing that? The Prophet used to, you know, he used to admonish the community. And today, you know, we can't say anything, you know. We can't say anything to anyone out of fear that, you know, you're going to be offended. 
It's a sad state to be in, man. Let me move over. For those of you who are on um, Facebook Live, you can actually go to um, Periscope. You can actually go to Periscope and see it better. My phone is about to die, so I had to switch it over so I can plug it in. All right. So are you waiting for Marodan, uh, Mufsidan? Are you waiting for a sickness to overtake you whereby it will disable you from worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then he said, Al Haraman Mufaniden. Are you are you waiting for a mental instability, a, a mental illness? So even the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with mental illnesses. Right? Are you waiting for mental illnesses to overtake you so that you become mentally unstable? And as I said earlier, some of us constantly put ourselves in situations that trigger mental illnesses. We put ourselves in, constantly put in ourselves in situations that trigger our mental illnesses. We go in and out of marriages with people that trigger our mental illnesses. You know, relationship after relationship after relationship with the wrong person eventually is going to drive you crazy. Relationship after relationship with the wrong person uh, is eventually going to drive you crazy. How many more marriages do we have to go through before we are completely insane? Think about that. How many more marriages do we have to go through before we have completely lost all of our scruples? I mean, it's, it's, it's a real situation. So... You know, while you're single, while you are single and you have that, you know, that breath of fresh air, you have that space where you can think clearly, you have that space where you're not under that emotional pressure to cater to someone else, take that opportunity to nurture your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Badiru bil a'mal, hasten to do good deeds while you're in a place of comfort and convenience before you are afflicted with a mental illness. Haraman, Mufaniden, before you are afflicted with a mental instability. Think about how many people go into relationships with people, man, and, and end up mentally unstable to even worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let alone, you know, be there for somebody else. Think about how many people go into relationships with other people, right, come out of that situation mentally unstable. That you can't even serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly because this person has ruined, has ruined you mentally. Think about, you know, a woman being in a relationship with a man and he's constantly verbally abusing her to the point where she doesn't even think that she can do anything right. Everything that she does is wrong. What she puts on is wrong. It's haram, you can't wear that, whatever the case may be. What she does is wrong. Why did you do that? Why aren't you doing this? Have the woman questioning, you know, her own sanity. Like, well, damn, am, am I even sane enough to walk these streets? Like, I mean, like, am I, you know, what is wrong with me? Every single thing that I do is wrong. You have a person questioning their own sanity. And this is as a result of being in a relationship of some, with someone who doesn't respect your happiness is in pursuit of their happiness, but in pursuit of their happiness by infringing on yours. Real talk, man. And then the sad thing about it is that we'll get out of a relationship and instead of nurturing and fostering that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we jump right back into another relationship. Jump right back into another relationship. Give me one second. Jump right back into another relationship, right? 
And the thing is, is that when you, you know, when you are single and you're not in a relationship, this is what the Prophet Sallallahu is talking about. Badiru bil a'mal, hasten to do good deeds while you're in a space of comfort and convenience and ease. Where you don't have a whole bunch of pressure and trial and tribulation on you. Take, that, take advantage of that opportunity and foster and nurture a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that when this situation happens, you already have conditioned yourself to worship. So much so that it becomes habitual. That you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't respect your individuality and it does not infringe. On your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's nothing because I was single for five years. I was single for ten years. I was single for seven years. And in that seven, five, ten year period, I developed a great relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I nurtured my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even when I go into a relationship with someone else, even though that relationship begins to crumble, it does not infringe on my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you guys understand where I'm coming from? I don't think you guys hear me, man. A lot of times I'm talking and I'm talking and sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself. Honestly. I feel like I'm talking to myself. I feel like I'm in a crowd of people, right? You remember, um, you remember the movie School Days, right? Spike Lee joint from back in the day. Remember towards the ending of the movie when um, my man from The Matrix, I'm forgetting his name, he stood in the middle of the crowd and he kept yelling, wake up, wake up loud while everybody's still walking around just like zombies, like nobody's hearing him. You know what I mean? Like, and that's the way I feel sometimes. Like you're yelling at the top of your lungs in the middle of the street and nobody can hear you. I mean, no, nah, that's cool. Like, you don't have to say I hear you. Like, I get it. If you hear me, then just respond by acting. You know what I'm saying? Act upon it. You know what I mean? But when I'm looking at the emails that I get on a daily basis, when I'm, you know, just visiting different communities and seeing the condition and the state of the Muslims, man, I, sometimes I just get the feeling that people just, you know, listening to lectures and things like that, it, be, it becomes, you know, ritualistic, you know? It becomes ritualistic, and it's not like people are actually, you know, absorbing the information that they're hearing. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is saying, are you waiting for haram and mufannidan? Are you waiting for some mental instability to overtake you where it begins to infringe on your relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? That if you are mentally unstable, the pen has been lifted from the person who is insane until they regain their sanity. You're not even held accountable because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows that you cannot worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala without your intellect. Once your mind has been compromised, you're mentally unstable, right? Your mind has been compromised. It's one of the, 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 the five basic necessities that every human being needs, their intellect, al-aql, which is why drinking khamar is haram. Things have been made haram for us in our religion because they infringe on your ability to, uh, on your capacity to use your intellect. Haram. Because you need your intellect to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Oh, mawtin mujhiza. Or are you waiting for a sudden death to come to you? Death can come to any one of us at any given time. And once death comes to you, there is no such thing as reincarnation in Islam. There is no coming back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Hatta idha ja'a ahadahumul mawt, qala rabbi rji'oon. That when death comes to one of them, they said, Oh my Lord, send me back. Perhaps I can do some good deeds that I, I neglected to do when I was there. There is no coming back. Allah says, no, it's just a word that comes out of your mouth. There's no reality to that. There is no coming back. Once death comes to you, there is no, my Lord, send me back. Lo anni karratan fa 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 I'm forgetting the other ayah. But there's another verse in the Quran where the person said, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, or at least a soul should say that if I could only go back and do some more good deeds, there, there is no going back. 
Are you waiting for death to overtake you suddenly? No one knows when they're going to die. No one knows. You go to sleep today and, you know, you never wake up. You put your keys in your ignition and pull off and leave your home and you never return. You never see your family again. That was the day that you were going to die. You get pulled over by a police officer. You think it's just for, you know, a broken tail light, and they end up shooting you. They end up assassinating you because that's what it becomes now. They're targeting, you know, black people, targeting African Americans and assassinating them. Spot, on the spot, with no remorse, no feeling, no nothing. And then go home and sleep with their wives, go home and go to sleep and play with their children like nothing ever happened. You think that they care? They don't care. These individuals are functioning like robots. We've become a police state. I was just in Newark, New Jersey. I was just in East Orange just a couple of days ago. Literally a, a cop car on every single corner in East Orange, New Jersey. Cop car. Then you go up to Bloomfield and Montclair and Verona. Not a cop in sight. <laughs> not a cop in sight. Step into the city of East Orange, Wallah well, Aladdin, a cop on every single corner. Is there such thing as over policing? Absolutely. We've become a police state. Police state. Meanwhile, African American youth are running around shooting each other, killing each other over the dumbest things. Meanwhile, your your block, your home. You know, your neighborhood is being occupied by police officers, white police officers, and sometimes black police officers who are worse than some of the white police officers. But are you waiting for death to overtake you suddenly? And he said, Awad Dajjal for Sharru Ibn Yuntadar. Or are you waiting for the Dajjal? Are you waiting for the Dajjal? And this is the worst to be expected. And our society, our environment is already preparing itself for the coming of the Dajjal. Muslims are some of the most corrupt people on the face of the earth, man. Muslims. Some of the most corrupt people on the face of the earth. Some of the most immoral people on the face of the earth. Our moral compass has been compromised as an ummah. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, man. Sad. Go to the Muslim world. Or what we call the Muslim world. Some of these places that we break in our necks to get to is just as bad as the society that we live in today, if not worse. He said, Or are you waiting for the hour which is most disastrous and most bitter? And when you die, unfortunately, your kiyama has already started. When you die, your kiyama, your reckoning has already started. So, this is what I wanted to present. I wanted to kind of, you know, revisit the hadith uh, and talk a little bit about that. Inshallah ta'ala. I don't know if uh, you guys had any questions or comments about what was presented. Uh, uh, Periscope, I'll turn you off and turn you back on, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslim kathira. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين